Hey, Embrace. How's everybody doing today? It's good to be with you. Uh, my name is Travis. If you don't know, um, I'm from the T campus. I'm the pastor over there. And so pumped to have you join us here at 57th Street. Uh, all of you guys join us online or one of our campuses or our network churches. And one of our prayers is always that uh, you would hear from God. I mean, I don't, that's a pretty big lofty statement, but that's, that's really our prayer is that uh, you would hear from God in a, in a way that is so real in your life. Man, it's not enough for us to come to church and just kind of hear in theory about God, but you would hear from him that's in a really real way. So I pray that that's true uh, for all of us uh, today. Um, so we've been in a series called Peeled Back. We've been talking about like peeling back the layers of our lives. And, and last week, Adam said that our lives are kind of like an onion. He brought this onion on stage and I heard it was a bit of a disaster. Like uh, the whole campus, if you sit in the front rows here, it smelled like onions, I heard most of the time. He told me, he's like, it was a powerful message. Like everyone was crying. I'm like, dude, that was the onions. Like that was, that was not you. Like you, you manufactured that. Maybe in that smoke that we have, we should just put like onion juice so everyone gets emotional. That's a terrible idea. But uh, we used an onion because onion has tons of layers. If you've ever peeled an onion, you can peel back layers. And then within those layers, there's more layers. And with those layers, there's more molar layers. It's, it's crazy how much you can peel back an onion, but that's like our lives. Our lives are like an onion. Like there's so much in here. We need to peel it back. Like we need to constantly peel it back so we can get to the heart, so we can understand who we are. And when we can understand who we are, we can better understand God. So Adam talked last week about peeling back our emotions. And today we're going to talk about something so awesome. You're going to be so pumped about this. We're going to talk about peeling back our past. And everyone's like, oh, God, I don't want to deal with my past. But we'll get there. Uh, when I talk about past, I'm really talking about two things. So I'm going to say past a bunch. I think I, I searched it. I got, like, I got the word past like 150 times in my, my message. But I'm really talking about two things when I talk about past. Critical events and family history. Critical events and family history. And let me define these for you. Critical events are what has happened to us. They're events. What has happened to us? Family history is who has influenced us. Let me say that one more, again, one more time. Critical events are what has happened to us. Family history is who has influenced us. Now, I know some of you are having this thought in your brain because I would have had this thought probably five years ago. Why do we need to talk about this? Like, why do I need to dig into my critical events? Why do I need to dig into my family history? And you're maybe saying something like this. The past is in the past. I can't change the past, so why should I peel it back? Now, that's true. You cannot change the past. But what I would like to convince you of today is even though you can't change the past, your past is changing your present. Let me say that one more time. Even though you can't change the past, your past is changing the present. Now, let me give you a couple examples of this. I might have shared this before. I'm not sure, but I say this really weird word all the time. I say Judas Priest a lot, not the band. Like, I, like when I get cut off in traffic, I'm like, Judas Priest. That's, what, that's, I, that's my Christian swear word. I guess instead of saying like Jesus Christ, like I use the betrayer instead of his name or whatever. I don't know. I don't know. But I was saying, I said that once in front of a friend and he said, what does that mean? And why do you say that? I said, I have no idea what it means, but I know why I say it. Because my dad has said it a thousand times growing up. Like he says it all the time, so much so that it's unconsciously become part of my vocabulary. I can't change my past, but my past is definitely changing my present. So that's kind of a funny example. Let me give you a little bit more serious of one. Uh, every first day of school until I was in fourth grade, I cried on the first day of school. That's too long, folks. That's too long to be crying on the first day of school. I remember I was in my fourth grade class, Mrs. Hermson class. I'm sitting at my desk and I'm just bawling. And all the kids around me are looking at me like, what is wrong with this kid? It was devastatingly embarrassing to me. And in that moment, I made the unconscious choice that I would never cry again. And I didn't for a very long time. The next time I can really remember 
crying was my wedding day, fourth grade to my wedding day, 26 years old, I think is how old I was when I got married. And I remember that day crying in front of a bunch of people, and I was so embarrassed. I lived, This is terrible. I didn't even enjoy my wedding to the fullest, fullest because I was so embarrassed that I had cried in front of everybody during my wedding. It was only within probably the last five years, they say this happens when you have kids, that I'd become more okay showing my emotions and, and crying. But the truth is, I can't change my past, but my past is changing my present. We like to think that our choices and our actions are free. We like to think that our choices and our actions are independent, but what if our choices and actions are slaves to the past? That's a big statement, isn't it? What if you're not as free as you thought you were? Most of the decisions we make, good or bad, are slaves to our past choices, critical events, and family history. You and I cannot go back and change our past, but we got to believe that our past is changing us. So today, I want to I want to start this process. It's a deep process, but I want to start this process with us by looking at the story of Joseph. Now, the story of Joseph, like we all had a past, but man, if you know this at all, Joseph had a past, like with like 18 A's in it. Like he had a past, like he had a lot of stuff that happened to him. And this is a long story in the Bible. It's from Genesis 37 to Genesis 50, and I'm going to read it all this morning. So just buckle up. Just kidding, I'm not going to do that. I'm going to paraphrase a lot of it today and pick out some verses here and there. But if you like to dig a little deeper into the messages afterwards, read Genesis 37 through 50. It's great. But in order to start this story, I kind of need to start at the end. So Joseph is this uh, powerful leader in Egypt. He's done lots of great things uh, for Egypt. He's actually the Pharaoh's right-hand man. And if you don't know what a Pharaoh is, Pharaoh would be like Egypt's king. He was almost like a godlike figure in Egypt. And Joseph became so powerful in Egypt, not by random chance, he did something for the Pharaoh. He interpreted one of his dreams. And this was not any dream. He interpreted a prophetic dream for Pharaoh. And he told Pharaoh, based on what I'm reading in your dream, there's going to be a famine in the land seven years from now. And because he interpreted that dream, Egypt started storing up grain for seven years, and then the famine hit. So Joseph interpreted this dream, and he became one of the most trustworthy, powerful people in all of Egypt. It's a success story. Joseph's story is a success story. But with any success story, we always got to peel back the layers. And Joseph has some layers. Let me tell you back. He had a past. I'm going to just share some of the things that happened to Joseph before this point in Egypt. Joseph was one of, Joseph was one of the favorite sons of Jacob, his father. He was the favorite child in Joseph's brothers hated Joseph for this. So much so that they decided to murder him. So they went, they grabbed Joseph and they're about to kill him. That's a traumatic event, right? Like about ready to be murdered. They grabbed Joseph. They're about to kill him. When one of his brothers said, hey, 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 we can't kill him. Let's just sell him into slavery. Now, that's probably better than being killed. But Judas, can't you just send him? I said just to Judas. You hear that? You can't we just send him back to, can't we just send him back to his father? No, they, they throw him in a pit. They sell him into slavery. This story's not done yet. He's in slavery and he gets accused for a crime that he didn't do. And he gets thrown in prison. So he goes from chosen child, almost being killed, slavery, now he's in prison. And that's not the end of it yet. He, while he's in pra- prison, he was good at interpreting dreams, and he interprets a dream, and he gets one of the prisoners in jail free. And the prisoner says, I'm so thankful for you, Joseph. I'm never going to forget you, and I'm going to get you out of jail. But he forgot. He forgot, and he left Joseph in prison. One family history thing, critical event after another. And then finally, we get to where we started the story. Joseph interprets Pharaoh's dreams. He saves Egypt, and he becomes this powerful leader in the whole country. So many critical events, so much family history. But what I want us to see from this story is this. 
Joseph had a past. And so do you. Joseph had a past, and so do you. Some of you, some of us, we think that we're a blank state, uh, blank slate, that we, we don't have a past, that we're unconscious of it, or it, it doesn't matter, but you have a past. Joseph had a past, and so do you. And if we want to process our past, we have to look at it. I want to give you a little bit of a genetics lesson here. I'm not a geneticist, not even close. So if you are, talk to me later about how incorrect I am with this. Uh, But a lot of scientists, and this varies from scientist to scientist, they believe that 50% of our personality comes from our DNA. That's insane. But if you have kids, you know that that could be true because they're all so different, right? 50% of our DNA, 50% of our personality comes from our DNA. So I want to break this down a little bit for us. So, so this is you at the bottom. Half of your DNA came from your mother and your father. Then half of your mother and father's DNA came from your grandparents. Half of your grandparents' DNA came from your great-grandparents. So you're half your mom and dad, but even deeper than that, if we take it out to the generations, you are quite literally one-eighth of each one of your great-grandparents. Do you know what your great-grandparents were like? Good, I don't. I don't know what they were like. But 50% of your personality comes from their DNA. That's crazy. Let's take it a step farther. Your great-grandparents, they learned good and bad things in life, and they passed them on to your grandparents. Your grandparents, they learned good and bad things in life, and they passed it on to your parents. Your parents, they learned good and bad things in life, and they passed them on to who? You. They passed on their DNA. They passed on all the good and the bad things that you have learned. What I'm trying to say is you are not a person. You are made up of a bunch of persons. You are not a person. You are made up by a bunch of persons. Pete Scazzaro, who wrote Emotionally Healthy Spirituality, that book Adam talked about, you should read that book. He summed it up so perfectly. He said, we might have Jesus in our heart, but grandpa is in our bones. We might have Jesus in our heart, but grandpa is in our bones. Or the Bible said it this way. I lay the sins of the parents upon their children. The entire family is affected, even children in the third and fourth generations of those who reject me. Sin passes on from generation to generation to generation. You are not a blank slate. When you were born, you were not a book of empty pages. You were a book that already had a lot written on it. And so we need to dig into our past. We need to realize we have a past in order that we can deal with it. So Joseph has a past, but let's keep reading into the story. The famine has gotten so severe in Egypt that it's affected the the surrounding areas and it's affected Joseph's hometown. So Joseph's father, Jacob, he says to the brothers, who have sent uh, Joseph into slavery, he says to the brothers, go to Egypt and get grain for the famine. You can see what's about ready to happen here, right? (laughs) Let's pick up the story there. Now, Joseph was the governor of the land, the person who sold grain to all its peoples. So when Joseph's brothers arrived, they bowed down to him. That's a turn of events with their faces to the ground. As soon as Joseph saw his brothers, he recognized them, but he pretended to be a stranger. Now, Joseph, he's a success story, right? He's a success story. He's become the leader, one of the big leaders in all of Egypt. Like he, everything is going right for Joseph, except for this. He still hasn't confronted his past. This is the truth I want us to see from this. You, no matter how good things are in your life, you are going to have to confront your past or your past will confront you. You have to confront your past or your past will confront you. We have to confront issues in our family history. Divorces, infidelity, bitterness, absent fathers, overprotective mothers. 
We have to confront issues with the events that have happened to us. Some of us have been abused. We made terrible choices. We've been bullying. Some of us have lost loved ones. We can't outrun this stuff. We need to confront it or someday it will end up confronting us. We can't outrun our past. So what does Joseph do? How does he confront his past? Well, it's a little bit messy, and this kind of happens over the next few chapters. So I just want to tell you some of the things Joseph did. He spoke very harshly with them. He wasn't very nice with his brothers. Um, He left them multiple times. He left the room to just bawl, just to weep out of their presence. He one time accused them of being spies, This is kind of crazy. He had them pay for the grain that they picked up, but then when they were leaving, he put the money back in their backpacks just to mess with them, I guess. And another time, he put a cup, like an heirloom from the palace. He put it in their backpacks, and then he accused them of stealing. He was all over the place. He was a hot mess when it uh, it came to confronting his past. But that's no different than us, is it? When we have to confront our past, it is messy. We don't know what to do with it. What do we do with this? How do the pieces go together? I got so many emotions and feelings, and it's a mess. Uh, confronting our past is a messy process, but, but one step that we can take to doing it is recognizing our pain points. Recognizing our pain points. Now, what's a pain point? A pain point is a place of vulnerability. It's a place place where the past is rearing its ugly head into our present. And I got five questions for you. These would be good ones to write down. They're also on, they're also online at our uh, IamEmbrace.com slash going further, these questions. But man, these questions will help you to identify where your, your past is affecting your present. Where in my life do I get defensive? Being defensive is one of the hallmarks of not dealing with your past? Where in my life do I overcompensate? Where do I do for others what I, they can do for themselves? Where do I do too much? Where in my life am I overly critical of myself and others? Not just others, but where am I overly critical of myself and others? Where in my life do I regularly get sad or angry? It's not, we all get sad and angry, but, but you see this continual uh, cycle of sadness and anger. Where do you see that? Where in my life do I know that I'm just faking it? You know, you're just like, God, that's not me. I'm just, I'm just trying, I'm just putting on a, a show. Where in your life do you see yourself faking it? If you answer these questions, truthfully answer these questions, you'll start to see these pain points in your life. Um, I, I've had a lower back issue uh, for two years now. I'm just getting old, I guess. But I've gone to many professionals about my low back issue, and they always ask me the same question. They ask me this question, did you have an injury in your past that is causing your present pain? That's a good question, isn't it? Did you have an injury in your past that is causing your present pain? That's a good question for our physical bodies, but that's even a better question for our spiritual and emotional selves. Think about that. Do you have an injury in your past that is causing your present pain? Joseph had to confront his past, and so will we. So Joseph has a past. He confronts his past. And let's see what happens in the next uh, part of the story. So a lot has happened And Joseph is with his brothers, and he's about to reveal to them that he is Joseph. They still don't know that he's Joseph. Joseph made himself known to his brothers, and he wept so loudly that everyone heard him. Joseph said to his brothers, I am Joseph. Is my father still living? But his brothers were not able to answer him because they were terrified at his presence. So after this, Joseph, he sends his brothers to go back home to get his father, Jacob, and to bring him back. So his brothers do that. They get Jacob. They bring him back uh, to Egypt, and Joseph gives them the best land in Egypt. He provides for them. He gives them food. He provides for all their needs for years. And then his father dies, and his brothers get a little nervous. Like you would think they would. They're like, Joseph is going to take revenge on us. 
Joseph is going to take revenge for his past. But look what Joseph says to his brothers. This is amazing. Joseph said to them, don't be afraid. Am I in the place of God? You intended to harm me, but God intended it for good. Joseph finds peace with his past. And we must do the same. When we start to dig into our past, the most difficult thing that you and I will do is to find peace with it, to find peace with it. Finding peace with your past, it could take moments, it could take months, it could take years, it could take decades, but it will be difficult. This the peace with the past, it doesn't come cheaply. You can't drive through McDonald's and get peace with your past. It takes digging in. Now, I believe, and I'm a pastor, so I, I probably have to believe this, but like I believe that the best place, maybe the only place that you can truly find peace with your past is at the feet of Jesus. Is at the feet of Jesus because Jesus has done things for us and he has shared truth with us that has the power to break the chains from our past. You just can't get this from self-help. You can't get this from Dr. Phil. You can get this from Jesus. Listen to some of these thoughts. Your past, it hands you, quite literally, it hands you an identity. You are your past. What does Jesus say? No, you're not. I have a different identity to, for you that is not connected to your past. Your past says, hey, look at everything you've done. You're unforgiven for that. Jesus says, that ain't true. I crawled up a cross. I died on a cross. I didn't die there for no reason. I died there to purchase your forgiveness. I died there to separate you from your past so that you wouldn't be held on to it. Unforgiveness. Jesus, your past says, uh, you, your past says that you're only your family history, right? Like you are just the sum of your family history. Jesus says, that's not true. Come follow me. I'm your friend. I'm your ideal. You don't have to follow the negative things of your family history anymore. You can follow me. Your past says you're all about your, you're just, you're just a, you're just the, the, the result of your poor choices. You're just a result of your poor choices. Jesus, no, 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 you're not. You're not a result of your poor choices. In fact, I have another path for you. It's a narrow path. It's not as wide as the path as your poor choices. It's a narrow path, but it leads to life. At the feet of Jesus, he says things to us. He has done things for us that can disarm the power of our past and bring us peace. But you can't drive through McDonald's to get it. I guarantee you can't. It takes time and you have to dig in to get it. And when you get this peace, there is some amazing fruit that you will experience you will stop blaming and complaining about your past. Amen in the house of God. Is there anything greater than that? When you, are, when you find the peace where you don't have to blame and complain anymore and you can move forward, God, we need some more of that. You will take ownership with how to move forward in the future. You will take ownership for that. You will stop letting your current emotions, Adam talked about this a little bit, you will stop letting your current emotions let their roots run all the way to your past. You can have emotions in the present that aren't dictated by what happened in the past. And this one's really great. You will stop letting your past make you feel shame for everything that you have done. Shame is a killer. That's the fruit of finding peace with your past. One of the most important fruits that comes, though, we got to look at in the next part of this verse. But Joseph said to them, don't be afraid. Am I in the place of God? You intended to harm me, but God intended it for good. I've already read that, right? Let's read the last part. To accomplish what is now being done, the saving of many lives. 
So then, don't be afraid. I will provide for you and your children. Joseph found peace with his past, but he realized it wasn't just about finding peace with his past. He understood that now he can provide for the future. Because he found peace with his past, now he can provide for the future. Just think about this. Because of Joseph's past, he saved up enough grain for all of Egypt to be saved. But not only Egypt, he saved his family because of that. But he didn't just save his family. His 12 brothers' descendants would become the nation of Israel. Because of Joseph's past, he saved the whole nation of Israel, which gave birth to Jesus Christ, who saved us all of our sins. Joseph's past saved millions millions. If you haven't heard anything I said I want you, uh, today, I want you to remember this, this statement. We must confront our past to find peace in our present so we can provide for the future. We must confront our past to find peace in our present so that we can provide for the future. Think about this. When you confront your past, when you find peace with it, you have gained something that no one else has. First-hand experience. You're like the mechanic that can fix a carburetor because you've done it a hundred times. You're like the farmer who knows how to plant car, uh, crops because they've done it year after year after year. When you find peace in your past, you've gained something. First hand experience and how you can provide it back to the world. If you have an absent father and you found peace in that, now you can provide for someone that has a dad. If you were abused and you found peace in that, now you can provide for someone that's been hurt. If you were an alcoholic and you found peace with that, now you can provide for the person that's just looking to take that next drink. If you made a ton of bad choices and you have found peace with that, now you can help the person who is almost ready to drive their life over the cliff. If we confront our past, find peace in our present, then we can provide for the future. God doesn't want us to stop just at finding peace or com confronting it. He wants us to use it for the good of the whole world. I had a conversation with a guy uh, probably two, three weeks ago. He called me up and he was really struggling this whole COVID season had been really hard uh, on him. He had gotten quarantined three different times for 14 days because of close contact. And he's just like, man, the loneliness and the discouragement, he's like, it's wearing me to nothing. I know some of you have been in that similar spot, right? It's wearing him to nothing. He said, I'm just so anxious. I'm so anxious about what's going on and it's affecting my, my, way, my, my job. It's affecting me as a father. And he was just like crying on this phone, just, just bawling. It was just, just a wreck. And then, and then he said something to me. It was really important. He said, during this season, I've been haunted by something that happened in my past. Sometimes we blame the COVID season, but maybe it's just unearthing stuff from our past, right? He said, I've been haunted by something in my past. And he shared with me, a very significant choice that he had made in his past. And he said, he said, Travis, I believe that God forgives. I believe that God forgives, but he can't ever forgive that. Have you ever been there before? You believe God can forgive, but he can't forgive that. And so as I sat on the phone with him, I was like, God, my cliche Christian answers aren't gonna work with this one. Hey, no, Jesus died for your sins. It's all good. You just forget about it. Like, that ain't going to work. This is something that had deeply affected him. And so I said to him, I said, I think why your past keeps haunting you is because God wants all of you. He wants the past, he wants the present, and he wants the future. And you're not going to be able to just sweep this one under the rug. You're going to have to dig in. You're going to have to process it. God will be with you, but it's going to take some digging. So we talked a little bit longer. And then he said to me, he said, he said, Travis, he's like, I've ignored this too long. 
I'm ready to take steps forward to heal my past. That's the question I want to leave us today. Are you done ignoring it? Are you ready to take the steps forward to find peace with your past? We all have something to dig into. Some of us have a little, some of us have a lot, but we all have something that we have to dig into. So we need to confront our past to find peace in our present so that we can provide for the future. Let's pray. Father, just take a deep breath. I just know some people are coming in here with some heavy stuff. I just know as I talk about past, there were some things that came in people's minds that they had pushed away, that they had covered up, that they had walled off, and they just wanted them to stay there forever. God, I just pray if someone has something that I just want them to know right now in the name of Jesus, by the power of your spirit, that, but that, that you're, you're a gracious God, that you're a kind God, that you will deal gently as they move forward with this issue. And that I, I want God them to know that there's life on the other side of this issue. There's life. There's peace. There's provision for all kinds of people if they just Step forward. God, I pray that people would know that they're forgiven. I pray that people would know that their identity isn't found in their family history. Their identity isn't found in what has happened to them. Their identity is found in the name of Jesus Christ, who calls us sons and daughters of the King. I pray that they would know that. We love you, Jesus. We pray this in your name. Amen.